Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Yeah, I mean, we're, I wanted to talk about the carnivore diet with you a little bit because I know you guys did a review on a book. Um, it's not a diet I've spent any time really thinking about. So I've basically spoken to, I don't know, a dozen people who have gone on it. And without exception, they all lose weight, um, which I think for some of them is their motivation for doing it. Um, and it must simply be that they just get tired of eating, right? They just <laughs> don't. They just can't take in the number of calories if they're doing it in that format. I think there's probably, so I would say that, you know, we don't have any good data on um, the impact of carnivore diet on, on weight. So, you know, there's no randomized controlled trials, but, you know, we have these anecdotes of people saying they lose a lot of weight. I certainly don't dispute that. Um, but I think if you came to me with this diet on paper and you asked me, would this cause weight? I would say absolutely, because it has multiple properties that I would expect to make it a particularly effective weight loss diet. One, this is something we could talk about more if you want, but it has zero carbohydrate. So I think that anywhere, if, if you're on the extreme of the fat to carbohydrate uh, ratio, in either direction, that's more slimming than being in the middle. So the most fattening diets are rich in both carbohydrate and fat. So there's zero carbohydrate. You're on the extreme, or I shouldn't say zero, very, very little. Right, so you're outside on the of the glycogen in the meat. That's yeah. about it. Yeah. There's a little glycogen. So you're on the very extreme end of uh, the macronutrient distribution. It's high in protein. That's also known to contribute to weight loss. You're eliminating almost every type of food. So your variety, the variety of your diet goes very low. I mean, you can prepare your meat in different ways. You can eat chicken or fish or beef or whatever, but the variety is greatly, greatly reduced. So that's, I think, part of it. Um, and you're cutting out all of these highly processed, calorie-dense foods that are the foods that I think, you know, we could debate about the why, but I think everyone agrees that those are foods that drive excess intake and elevated body fatness. So I think all these things together, it's just even on paper, it's a diet that I would very much expect to cause weight loss more to greater degree than your average diet. And while we're on that topic, um, what are, I mean, tell me a little bit about your review of this, because I know you've put some time into this. Uh, and for folks that are wondering, you know, I, I don't really plan to do a, do a podcast on the carnivore diet. I, um, I, I doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me, although I don't dispute that there are people who I think have had very, um, successful outcomes on it with respect to dealing with some of their physical ailments. Um, so maybe it has a role in sort of overcoming some acute illness. Um, and maybe I'm just biased towards thinking plants are valuable, but I, I guess I, I, it seems to me that one of the core tenets of the, of the diet is that plants are sort of low, low grade toxic, right? I mean, isn't that sort of part of the thesis? Yeah. The thesis is basically everything is toxic except grass fed animal foods. <laughs> Um, so like even tap water is considered, uh, not optimal, but, um, yeah. So the, the book spends a lot of time, like going through the litany of all the potentially harmful compounds in, in plant foods. And actually, you know what? I, I sympathize with some of this. I think there is a bias toward thinking if it's in a plant, it's healthy. And I don't think that's true. I think the book is right that that's not necessarily true. And I think there are some plant compounds that at least for some people are not so good. And, you know, there are well characterized examples of this. Like if you eat a lot of spinach, you can get kidney stones from all the oxalate. Um, there are studies suggesting that the glucosinolates in um, cabbage family plants might contribute to type two diabetes. Uh, you know, there's like kidney beans. If you don't cook them enough, they can be really toxic because of the lectin. So it's not like there aren't examples of this. It's, 
it's definitely true that to some degree, I think it just gets taken far beyond where the evidence is. And, you know, the way to think about how healthy a food is, is not to say, does it contain toxins? It's to say, what's the cost benefit analysis on this food? And most importantly, what are the empirical outcomes that we can see when it, when it's directly, when its impacts on health are directly studied? So, you know, like this is something that I've kind of focused on in my evaluation of uh, some of the ideas that are put forth in the public sphere is that a lot of people with um, a lot of people who are coming out with, uh, let's say, unusual ideas in this sphere, they really they take a mechanism and they run with it like you know, X toxin is really bad, like lectins, for example, Gundry. Lectins can do X, Y, Z. Lectins are in plants. Therefore, we shouldn't eat these types of plants. And that's really like a bottom-up approach, like extrapolating empirical effects on health from mechanism, when really, I think in a complex field like nutrition, it's better to start with the empirical evidence, like, oh, we have this study that suggests that there's actually an effect on health. Let's see if we can understand the mechanism. What are some of the um, biochemical changes that occur in people on a, a carnivore diet? I mean, the obvious one must be the dyslipidemia, right? Yes. So, you know, there is there's a shift uh, toward a ketogenic metabolism because of the fact that it's very low carbohydrate. Um, that would be an obvious shift that occurs um there you know i i don't know if i'd use the term dyslipidemia but one of the terms that one of the potential downsides i focused on in the review that is um downplayed by many carnivore diet advocates including paul saladino is um the change in ldl cholesterol and ldl particle count so and again, we don't have great evidence here, and this is kind of the crux of our review of the book on Red Pen Reviews, is simply that there are a lot of claims made that are not supported by any kind of uh, convincing evidence. But um, we have some evidence. So there's this survey study that was done on something like 2,000 carnivore dieters. Um, I think David Ludwig was involved in that, and they just reached out to people in social media groups, like their Facebook groups and things, and they administered this survey. And one of the questions was, what was your various blood lipid values before and after this diet? And you see that there are changes in positive and negative directions. Triglycerides go down as, as you would expect. Um, I don't remember what HDL did, but it probably went up. Yeah. And then there was a large increase in LDL cholesterol. And so that's a concern, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and I think you would agree. And Paul Saladino himself, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on him. I don't want to make it personal, but he's, uh, you know, been public about some of this stuff. So I, I think it's, it's fair to point out, to, to just repeat what he himself has said, but his LDL cholesterol is 533 megs per deciliter. And his LDL particle count is also absolutely through the roof. And um, so it, not everyone responds like that. Like if you look at the, the survey data, I think there was a mean increase of like 30 megs per deciliter in LDL, 30 or 40, something like that. Um, so I think it depends on the individual. I think some people like Sean Baker's lipids are fine. He's another carnivore diet guy. Last time I saw his lipids look just fine. So I think it depends on the individual. Um, but some people do experience a large increase in LDL cholesterol. And I mean, you know more about this than I do, but that certainly raises red flags for me in terms of cardiovascular risk over the long run. Yeah, the thing I've never understood is, um, <clears throat> and this is probably true of not just carnivore, but ketogenic or anything that um, that does produce that hyperbeta lipoproteinemia. Um, 
it, it's it, it almost seems to be worn by some as a badge of honor as opposed to saying well maybe this diet is doing a lot of really good things for me it's improving my insulin sensitivity i feel better i have fewer energy swings but this one thing isn't so good but here's the thing of all the things that could go wrong that's about the most treatable one out there it's very easy to treat elevated apob <laughs> uh and so that that's the part I mean, and this is what we do clinically right this is how we treat patients right we have patients who only get better on very very carbohydrate restricted diets <laughs> Thank you.